Hi, Smart Pack fans. Welcome back to our Ask the Vet video series with Smart Pack staff veterinarian and medical director, Dr. Lydia Gray. I'm Smart Packer Sarah, and once again, we're here answering your questions as submitted on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and all our other channels, um, and then voted on by fans like you. Right. Today we'll be doing the top five questions, and for all the Ask the Vet updates, you can always check out blog.smartpack.com. Excellent. One quick note on last month's video, as uh -oh. I'm sure you remember, okay. we had a second question from Kelly, Yes. and her questions were written so well, and I happened to say, you know, I think we might have a future DVM right, on our right. hands. Turns out, I'm psychic. You, you are? She commented on the video and said she is a, currently applying oh, to vet school. That's excellent. Yeah, cool. so she'll be joining your nice. ranks. All right, so she can do this. She, I mean, <laughs> I think she would probably need as much experience as you have, so, oh which is, considerable. All right, so let's jump in with our first question. Okay. This one comes from Instagram, and Kamania124 says, what is your advice on warming your horse? I typically warm every six months mm. with different pastes. What do you suggest? How and I was going to say, I will settle have? in, <laughs> because I know this is going to be a this, good one. This might be my favorite topic. If not, it's the second favorite. It's very close. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about this because the parasite control, the paradigm, there's been a paradigm shift. Ooh, I know. Uh, parasite I, love, paradigm. I love when I can say that. The, the advice we were given 50 years ago, before I was born even, I love it, I can also say that, <laughs> was to rotate dewormers every two months or so because the dewormers we had didn't get all of the species of worms the horses had. That doesn't exist, that's not true anymore. Plus, we have the added problem of resistance in the parasites. So now the thinking has turned around dramatically, and more and more people are getting on board, which is a good thing, that you need to do the fecal egg per gram counts. Mm. So you need to find out how many eggs, parasite, warm eggs, your horse is shedding. This doesn't tell you, contrary to what people think, how many worms your horse had. Okay. That's, there's not good correlation. What it tells you is if your horse is a high shedder or a low shedder, which means how much is he putting out? Is he contaminating the environment? Oh, so it's more about looking forward rather exactly. than a current check. Yeah, and okay. then if you have a low shedder, you might only need to deworm that horse once, twice a year. But a high shedder needs dewormed more frequently so that he's not pooping out worms and making the environment full and then reinfesting themselves. Okay, so, so people think it's hard, but it's, it's not actually. It's do the fecal and then figure out what frequency your horse needs. And of course, this all comes with your veterinarians because every location is a little bit different in the country. So it's, it's pretty simple. When you talk about that people used to rotate dewormers, what does that mean? Are they just like switching brands or when you chemical talk about rotation? Chemical classes. Some okay. people switch brands, but it was important as switching chemical classes. Okay. So we go from like a benzimidazole. Um, like a, a fenbendazole, and then to a, a, a parental pamoate, and then to an ivermectin or moxidectin. And people will get into this rotation of like every other month. You don't have to do that anymore. Oh. Because of the resistance, some of the chemical classes don't work anymore. Mm. Like, not that they don't work as well, they flat out don't work, period. Mm. So it's like giving your horse a tube of water or some sort of... Except he taste. enjoys it much less. Oh, much less. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, a friend of mine said, don't just, you don't get points for going through the motions. Mm. You have to use something that works, and the way you know it works is by doing fecals and working with your vet. Okay. All right. So That was, I'm, I'm impressed. I did, I did pretty good. I did pretty good at keeping it down, yeah. Yeah. All right, so we have Candice on YouTube who's wondering, my horse had an abscess and I wanted to know, how does an abscess form? How and why does it burst? Okay. Yeesh. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I consulted our hoof, hair, hoof health consultant, Danvers Child, for this. And he wrote, although the hoof provides a barrier against the elements, it's not impermeable. And there are numerous pathways for bacteria to enter the hoof capsule, especially at the sole or the, the bottom mm -hmm. and the wall, the, this part, the vertical, the junction where those two meet. Occasionally, a bacterial pocket will develop as an extremely localized infection. So it's an infection, is what an abscess says. Creating pressure due to buildup, inflammation, and white blood cells. As this pocket attempts to expand and encounters the rigid hoof wall, 
it creates extreme internal pressure and seeks an outlet or a vent. And in doing so, it migrates or moves and follows the path of least resistance, eventually erupting at the heel bulbs of the coronary band, mm. like where the skin is, where there's no more hoof. Mm -hmm. So, sounds pretty unpleasant. It's extremely painful, and it's been likened to when you hit your finger with a hammer, mm. and then the nail, your finger throbs, and the pressure has nowhere to go because you have the rigid nail there. Right. Yeah, but horses have to walk on it, <laughs> so that's why you can see them with this be three-legged lame. Yeah. 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 Okay. Do not want no. abscesses. No. So Chase on YouTube is wondering, my vet has recently told me that she thinks one of our horses has neurologic EHV1. Oh. I don't know very much about this, but I was told it could spread. Are my other horses in danger? What can I do for my current horse with this condition? Is euthanasia the best option? Wow, so with these we like to have a lot of fun, you know, but this is a really serious a one. topic and yeah. I, feel, I feel bad for this person. Um, EHV1 or equine herpes virus 1 is, um, is a serious condition and it's, what, ha what happens is there's three presentations or way this disease can present and so respiratory is, is probably common, is most common and then um, abortion storms they call them when a, a bunch, mm -hmm. a big, like a, a, a broodmare farm, a bunch of mares have this and then rarely, but enough that we take notice now, they have this neurological presentation mm. and it starts out with a fever there can be some respiratory signs. I don't know what her horse had, but the neurologic signs are, um, the, the scientific word is ataxia, but it means wobbly or incoordinated. Um, and, and when that happens, I mean, it's, it's a reportable disease in states, and so the, your, your, you, you tell your vet and he tells the state vet, and, mm -hmm. and it, that barn is probably now under quarantine, mm -hmm. and they typically don't release the quarantine until 21, maybe 28 days. They have to make sure that the horses don't, um, they're not actively shedding it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so they, have, they do nasal swab testing and blood testing, and, and follow the disease progression around, but um, within the barn even they'll quarantine. The, the horses that have clinical signs, from the ones that have positive tests, from the ones that are absolutely, you know, 100% normal. Mm -hmm. So um, this is, just, we always talk about work closely with your vet, but this is one where there's no option. I mm -hmm. mean, you do exactly what your vet and the state vet tells you. And, and as far as the quality of life issue, I mean, that's a decision that you have to make personally and your, your vet weighs in on and, and friends and family and that sort of thing. So um, I don't have a percentage number for the, the ones that develop clinical signs of, of neurology and then what, you know, how many need really euthanasia, but um, there, there is a link between the seriousness of the neurological signs. Like, if you're just a little wobbly, that's one thing, but if you're down and can't get up, mm -hmm. that's much more significant. Sure. So those are the kind of things that your veterinarian will weigh into the decision and the advice. Yeah, and continue to evaluate the horse and you know, give exactly. you an updated prognosis. And, and of course, treat them. They, they treat the, the, the signs. So they'll sure. try to reduce the fever. They'll try to um, calm down the inflammation in the nervous system. So mm -hmm. they'll do things to help the horse. They'll probably give fluids to make sure that the horse stays hydrated and painkillers right. and that sort of thing. With um, EHV1 and you know, kind of herpes outbreaks in general, it sounds like we're seeing, at least me personally, even on my own just Facebook newsfeed, more news of horse show grounds being closed and things like that with more outbreaks. And I recently saw USCF um, updated their vaccination requirements. Can you talk a little bit well, about that? Well, it's called the, the new use of vaccine rule because they didn't used to have it. This is the first year that it's been um, around and a rule and enforced. And it, I think their year starts December 1st, so we're six months in, but you have to have proof that your horse has been vaccinated with influenza and rhino pneumonitis, which is the other name for aging, mm. um, within six months of entering the showgrounds. Mm -hmm. Because it is, it, as you were saying, it's something that once it happens is so serious, you know, that people are trying yeah. to be more proactive. And then it's spread from horse to horse, and commingling and stress seems to activate shedding of the virus. Which is a great description of a showground. Exactly. Commingling yeah. stressed horses, yep. Yep. yeah. Okay. Our fourth question was submitted by Molly, and she also asked on YouTube, how long should you wait to give your horse water after a good oh. workout? Can the water be cold or should it be a moderate temperature? This is a great question. I love this question. I'm so glad that, that, that someone finally asked it. There is no need to wait at all. Really? That, that is an old wives' tale. I'm not sure how it got started. I think 
I read somewhere maybe it was the black beauty story. Mm. Because remember, he did some oh, yeah. gallop, the person was sick and like, got to the barn and the young groom gave him water and didn't cool him out and then he got... He got, got the colic, yeah. I swear to God, if that's where this started, but <laughs> <laughs> the research says, let's, so now modern science, the research says there's no reason to wait. And in fact, if you wait, they might not drink as much. Mm. They're, it seems that they're thirstier in the first 15, 30 minutes after they work, and then it gets blunted, and then they're like, no, I'm good. So if you offer them water right away, they'll drink more. Right, to rebuild uh, what they lost in sweat. Yeah. But then if you leave them, they don't. They, they just They're like, I'll drink a little bit. So there's, there's lots of advice out there about withhold water completely, which is a really bad idea. And then there's a more moderate devices as well. Let them, you know, walk them and let them have a few sips. Their stomachs have two gallons in it. So I think two gallons is probably fine to give them, you know? I mean, I don't know a lot of horses that are gonna sit in one drink or one, one spot and take two gallons, but let them have what they want. Okay. It's a good way to rehydrate, cool down, recover. Think what you would want. To what I do want when right. I come in from yeah. working out. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, all you young adult authors out there, you have a lot of responsibility to get the facts right because otherwise you could be perpetuating Hundreds the next of old wives' tale. Exactly. Yeah. Thirsty horses, man. Our last question is by Hope M. Taylor Double Zero on Instagram. And she's wondering My horse was in all day and then gets turned out during the night. My mother is worried she's not getting enough vitamin D. What is something that could help her receive vitamin D? That's an interesting question. Well, I am not going to answer the question because I don't know that a horse needs it. I had this a few years ago on the regular Ask the Vet, so there's mm -hmm. a blog on it. So I'm cheating by reading, <laughs> using my own blog for research because I did. I looked things up and I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. So whenever there's a nutrition question, I always go to the NRC, the Nutrient Requirements Forces, and what they said is there are no reports of vitamin D deficiency to date in horses maintained in practical settings with some exposure to sunlight. And several other sources they looked at said a few hours of sunlight a day, and one even said as little as one hour of sunlight a day. Hmm. So, you know, consider the horse that lives, I mean, basically, it's outside, it's not in a house with curtains, <laughs> right? Um, so there is exposure to sunlight, and we don't slather them with um, sunscreen like sure. people. So. I'm sh I think she's probably fine. This, this horse is fine. Yeah, you don't have to be out standing in direct noon sunlight to get what you need. Right. No, yeah. like tanning bed with the reflector. Not. Yeah, I don't know Not a lot necessary. of horses that would do that. No, no. no. Newman wouldn't be into that. Well, he, yeah, he would. I feel do like that. he likes relaxing. Yeah, he's a bit. Yeah, he's a bit of a diva. Yeah. All right. Well, those are all of our questions for this month. Thank you guys for submitting such awesome and varied topics. Really it's really good. fun. And timely. Yeah, think, yeah. Absolutely. So we're going to be accepting questions for next month's video starting now, and you can submit them on all of our social media channels using hashtag AskTheVetVideo. That's on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, Pinterest, if you wish. Um, we obviously YouTube, and then you can email them to customer care at smartpack.com if you want the personal touch. You can also comment in the blog comments uh, because we post these videos on our mm -hmm. blog. And as Lydia mentioned, we also have many Ask the Vet blogs um, going back years and years and years. So there's a lot of good stuff if you guys want to do some reading there. But no, no pressure to make a good question because these were some these were some pretty good ones. So although if you do make a good question, you could could win a smart pack gift card oh, right, if right. your question is voted into the top five mm -hmm. so that's a pretty good incentive mm -hmm. and if you've received if, it, if we've answered one of your questions and you haven't gotten your gift card yet you can just uh, direct message us on YouTube or you can email customer care at smartpack.com and we'll get that straightened out yeah. for you because you want to get that that's a nice reward yeah. all right well thank you guys so much for tuning in don't don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss the next ask the vet mm -hmm. video and have a great ride